So uh, hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, this um, web conversation is sponsored by Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, Burlington Branch. And today we are hopefully including many other folks from the newly founded Vermont Peace Anti-War Coalition. My name is Robin Lloyd, and today we're focused on tax day. It's coming up in one week on April 18th. Um, and before we get going with the two fascinating speakers, I'd like to share this um, pie chart. Are you able to see the pie chart? Yeah. Yeah, the uh, federal year tw uh, 2024. Um, it's uh, something that uh, the War Res Resisters League has put out for years and is really full of a uh, lot of fascinating information. And we will have a whole bunch of them. And uh, Duncan will have a bunch of them in White River Junction. Um, and uh, we'll be at the State House this Saturday with a table. And we need vo volunteers to help out. OK, um, so today we're honored to uh, have Ashik Siddiqui with us, who is a re research analyst at the National Priorities Project. And I think I will, for the moment, get rid of the uh, of the graphic. Oops. No, I don't want that either. OK, I want to get back. Stop share. There we go. Um, here we are. Hi, everyone. <laughs> yes. Um, and um, uh, so uh, Ashik is, um, works with the National Priorities Project, which got started way back in 1983 at the height of the Reagan era when um, uh, activists wanted to find out why their hometown, which is Northampton, and I remember those days because I was often going down there to the um, Peace Development Fund meetings in the same town, uh, that Northampton was crumbling uh, okay. because uh, social services were being shut down. And uh, yeah, that was during the, the dismal Reagan era. Um, so now the organization has gone on to join the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington, D.C., um, and it's, um, which is perhaps the largest progressive think tank uh, in Washington at the moment. So let us welcome Ashik um, to tell us how the MPT, the in, in, NPP works and how it can be useful for to activists to understand where our money really goes when we send it off to the IRS. And there'll be opportunities for some questions at the end, but not too many, because we also want to hear and welcome our second speaker, Mary Beth Mayer. So take it away, Ashik. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I am based in North Carolina, so I'm, I'm happy to join you all virtually. Um, before I get started, can I get screen share permissions? Whoever is host, if you make me a co-host, I can. Oh, yes, OK. Share some visuals. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Uh, so while I wait for that, um, I, I guess just uh, I, I'm joining you just a few uh, days before tax day next week. And we NPP does an annual tax day analysis that we're actually going to publish uh, hopefully by the end of this week. So what I'll be showing you today is um, from last year, uh, but the analysis that we'll have in a couple of days, um, which I'll, I'll be happy to pass it on once it's ready, uh, we'll have some updated numbers and graphics. Um, so okay, what we'll I, be... I think you can share now. Okay, great. I see it. Thank you. So I just dropped a link in the chat to our website, uh, which is what I'll be show just walking through a couple of the tools that MPP has available that we uh, keep updated based on uh, available federal budget data. So starting at nationalpriorities.org, uh, we have a couple of tools uh, that we use. One is the tax receipt and the other is trade-offs. Um, so these first I'll just show um, an overall graphic that we use that's similar to the one that, that you were just shown, which is our discretionary 
budget pie chart that shows a breakdown of how uh, the budget that Congress allocates each year um, is is allocated. So as you can see here, almost a half of it goes to the military budget. Uh, last year is actually a little bit less proportionally than most years because of COVID. There's much more social spending. But this year, uh, we'll have the graphic updated soon. The military is right back up to a half, and it's actually higher than it's been in, in many years. Um, higher, almost as high as at the height of the war on terror in the Obama years and um, approaching the level of, of World War II, basically, uh, which is the historical high military budget in the United States. So one of the tools that we have uh, that hopefully uh, your organizations can find useful is the trade-offs tool, which you can see from the Explorer the Budget uh, drop-down menu. So this is where we uh, break down a few different categories of spending, uh, militarized spending, um, and and various programs that uh, we think are funded at levels that are much higher than needed, if they're needed at all. Um, and there are trade-offs that we show uh, all, all that could have been funded instead. So in, in the most recent available year, uh, taxpayers in the US paid $740 billion for the military, that could have gone to any number of other social priorities instead. That could have funded 6 million nurses, uh, almost 90 million public housing units, et cetera. And it goes on just uh, even 1% of the military budget. If you ch choose that, that's still 66,000 nurses, almost a million public housing units, um, 18 million households with wind power, like all these things that the government should be funding that are a collective goods for society but are, are not funded. Instead, we have this massive militarized government apparatus. So there are a few ways you can break it down. So, so you can choose different programs and see the trade-offs. You can also break it down by location. So if you're based in Vermont, for example, um, I'm not too familiar with the geography of Ver Vermont, but let's just say uh, Burlington is a town I'm familiar with. Um, you can break it down um, according to how much federal taxes were paid by residents of Burlington or whichever location you choose by city, county, or district, congressional district. And you can see even that would have paid for you know over 100 public housing units, um, almost 3,000 households with wind power, et cetera. So things that would really make a difference in your community versus this militarized spending, just 1% of the federal budget. So this is a tool that folks uh, often find useful that we keep updated every year. The other tool that we have, um, so, so you can feel free to explore this um, on your own time, and hopefully that can be useful in your advocacy. The other tool that we have is the tax receipt, uh, which is what we'll be uh, updating later this week. So this is an analysis that we do every year, and we, we break down um, categories of spending that are somewhat different than the discretionary budget. This also includes um, what is... Uh, uh, more directly coming from taxpayer funds. So the largest category here um, is, in the previous year was Medicare and Health, second was unemployment and labor, military was third. Um, in the past, military was number one, but because of rising healthcare costs, healthcare has become number one. Um, last year is the first year that unemployment and labor was number two, but um, in the analysis we'll publish in a couple of days, military is back up to number two. The only reason unemployment and labor was so high the previous year is because of the, the COVID stimulus um, programs. So there, there are a few different things that this taxpayer, um, that this tax receipt does. We show, we show something that we call a tax receipt, like imagining that the government um, um, everything that's allocated from taxpayer funds is itemized according to different categories. So we do state-by-state state breakdowns. I'm just going to show you the United States average taxpayer breakdown. So in the previous year, the average taxpayer in the U.S. paid a little bit over $13,000 in taxes. So our tax receipt breaks that down into a few different, uh, 13 different categories and then different specific programs. And you can see how much um, the average taxpayer paid. You can also enter a number of your specific number um, or, or amount of taxes paid. You can also go state by state to see what it looks like. But overall, this is what it looks like. So for the Pentagon and military, the average taxpayer paid about $2,000 um, out of their own pocket, basically. Out of that, um, almost $62 went to nuclear weapons. Almost $1,000 went just to military contractors. And you can compare that to 
any number of social programs that we include here. For example, homeless assistance got only about eight dollars. Disaster got about one hundred twenty dollars. So, if, if you make those kinds of comparisons, like for renewable energy, it's less than six dollars. Um, so compared to the militarized spending, um, it's it's a lot less for things that folks might find useful. So we try to pull out talking points based on that about um, what 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 was funded versus what was not funded. So um, we have some graphics that I can show you. Um, Okay, I already showed you that one. Um, so yeah, uh, that's in a nutshell, the presentation that we do each year that we'll have updated pretty soon uh, with the latest numbers from the previous year. So happy to take any questions. So are there some simple um almost like slogans that we can take with us for uh, a Saturday. Um, I mean, this one that you were looking at, maybe we can print that out. If you paid taxes, you likely paid that much. Okay. And that's based on an average of, what did you say, 13,000? Yeah. These are the kinds of, uh, so, so for the previous year, we had a few top line trade-offs that we thought were interesting to highlight. So compared to the number, the, the amount that goes to private contractors, only that much was given to K through 12 education. Mm -hmm. um, for nuclear weapons, it's almost three, like double what we gave to the CDC, uh, which is pretty stark in a time of, uh, you know, after several years of COVID. Uh, for deportations and border control, the government paid this much more versus renewable energy. Uh, for prisons, it's more than double what we gave to homelessness uh, assistance. Well, that would be a good one for us to use because we'll be at a um, a rally on uh, federal prisons calling for there not to be a federal prison for women. In oh, that, that's great. Yeah, so, so these are from the previous year, from 2021. So in a couple of days, hopefully by the end of the week, we'll have numbers updated for 2022. Uh, so if your event is this weekend, then um, we're hoping to have it up by Thursday or Friday at the latest. Good. She, can you say how, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Can you just say how you got to that? I have another laptop here. Uh, you, you mean how we found the status? Where you are now. Yeah, how you found that. Oh, so we we break down. Go to explore the budget. Yeah, so we break down the amounts that are. Uh, yeah. So so we we basically take ratios of how much went to particular categories of spending versus the overall budget. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then take those ratios against um, the average taxes paid. So there's a set of st uh, state and federal data about how much the uh, average yeah. taxpayer paid. And, um, across, the, across the country, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's how uh, you as an individual, you can take the amount that you paid in taxes. Let's just yeah. say it was uh, 10000 And um, the same receipt will, will, will break that down. Um, yeah. And so, so you're on the Explore the Budget menu. Um, and that's where you got the that last graphic we were looking at, which was um, homelessness versus what was the yeah. one federal prisons. So yeah. how did you get to that? Oh, okay, that page, the one with the dollar. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. This is great. This is so we just great. click on that dollar to get the the little graphics you made. Is that right? That's right. If you just go to our homepage, National Priorities, and you can you click where your taxes went, you'll see that dollar graphic, and then you can click through that to the tool. Cool. And uh, the full analysis that we'll publish later this week will be linked from reports here. So if you scroll down, that's last year's analysis. In a couple of days, you'll see tax oh, data. Oh, okay. Cool. Mm -hmm. So there's more than the 22, 21. Uh, information 
Yeah, and the reason but you'll that update we this year is yeah. because um, in uh, every year in in this usually February or March, this year is in early March. The president's office puts out their budget request for the next year. So uh, the Biden administration put out their budget request for 2024 um, last month, and that includes all the data for what was spent the previous year. So in 2023, in the president's request for 2024, it also includes everything that was spent in 2022. So that's why um, you, you might see different kinds of numbers floating around, like, like I saw in the graph you just shared, that was for what is requested for 2024. Um, which uh, that 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 makes sense to to message around for for our, for the purposes of our tool, we itemize what was spent the previous year. Um, so that that's just a distinction that might be useful to make. Well, are you crutching the uh, statistics for uh, this year already? Because I think. Uh, uh, Beth Ann is going to be telling us about how, well, yes, last year, lots of money was put into the, the public system and helping people out in various ways, but now all that's going to be cut. So the, um, the, 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 all the statistics that you deal with will be <laughs> changed greatly, I think, uh, probably in the coming year. Yes, of course. So, so the president's request for the following year is subject to all the haggling in Congress. So typically the budget for the next year is not approved until the end of, of this year. So what was requested for 2024 um, is still different than what, what Congress may approve by the end of the year. So that's where advocacy and activism comes in because that, that could potentially impact what Congress decides to allocate. Mm -hmm. Um, are there other questions? I, I have one. Yes, uh, Ricky. Yes, I, uh, 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 Sheik, I, I noticed the 9% uh, on the dollar bill graphic, the 9% point something in debt service. Um, I wonder if that is um, a number that you have seen grow uh, over the last, say, five years or so. That is a good question. Um, I don't recall offhand. If you look through our website, you can see uh, previous years. Um, oh, you can. Good. Yeah, we have previous years analyses. I think um, it, in previous years, it's possible it was higher or fluctuated. I, I, I'm not sure offhand. Like I'm just seeing for 2019, for example, it was 16 cents. And for 2021, it's down to nine cents out of the dollar. So um, Interesting. That, okay. that tells you what share it was of the overall budget. It might not tell you the overall amount, which uh -huh. is a distinction to make because the size of the budget can change as well. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm. Okay, I see a question from Jane. Um, yeah, um, yeah did, um, did, you, uh, did you say about half of the budget goes to the military? Um, and that, um, and yes, I guess that was one question. And then, and then, but you said that there was about an equal amount spent. I mean, I mean that Medicare was about an equal amount compared with the milit with the military budget. I, I mean, with the that we pay, when you broke it down, mil that uh, that we paid about the same amount for the military budget. It's, I mean, I mean, wait a minute. Um, in that in one graphic, but then you said half that it was. Uh, yes, I, 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 I didn't hear correctly that it was was the, okay. First, was the mil is the military half paying for the military half the budget? One question, and then I guess I guess the Medicare. How what is a what what a percentage of the budget is that? Yeah, this is where. We make distinctions between the discretionary budget and the mandatory budget. So I'm going to drop a link uh, to our website that's that we call Federal Budget 101 that breaks down um, a few different kinds of spending. So there's the discretionary budget that Congress allocates every year, of which uh, the military is about half year after year. 
Um, but then there's the mandatory budget, which includes large pockets of spending like Medicare and Social Security uh, that mostly come out of um, trust funds, which um, include uh, things that are funded by payroll taxes, but it's um, it's not something that Congress allocates year after year. It's they're, they're, they're considered permanent programs. So that's where you see in, in the tax dollar graphic, we separate federal funds from trust funds. So trust funds uh, can only be used for specific programs like Social Security and Medicare. All the other funds are federal funds, which include revenue from your federal income taxes and can be used for a wide variety of purposes. So um, that that can be a little bit confusing if you want to talk about how big a share of military spending is of the federal budget. Um, that's why when we're talking about um, advocacy that, that tries to impact what what you know citizens can impact more, which is what Congress allocates every year. We talk more about the discretionary budget, yeah, uh, because military is a huge share of that. Um, but for the purposes of tax day, for the tax receipt, uh, we're talking specifically about what your taxpayer funds are used for, which does include uh, large shares of of health and um, unemployment or social security spending. And that's where the Republican. And that and and that's and that's where people get messed messed up on. I mean, that's where you get um these get decept get that's where that's where people can get deceived about how much the military makes because because then because then because because people can because then people the republic probably Republicans can point to that. We point to the mandatory budget and say, "See, see how, see, 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 Medicare is is draining the budget. We're going to have to cut amounts to Social Security and that kind of stuff, and that kind of stuff. I mean, and 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 other things, but 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 any but but when you look at the discretionary budget, that I mean, I'd added to that, I'd be in a different picture. It's not, it it's." It, um, a different it's a it's a it's a different pic it's a different picture okay. um yeah i mean no. yeah so, so we gotta be careful i mean in any ways so that can be uh, yeah so that's that's the most uh basic idea of the uh, uh of the website is the dis uh, distinction between discretionary and um uh non-discretionary funds uh but in other words our income tax what we pay is for the discretionary amounts the others are set set in uh concrete although congress can play around with those too but those are not uh, uh paid by our uh, yearly income tax um any other any other questions uh, I would just like to uh, bring up that we had in our disarm call just uh, Sunday uh, a report about the ICBMs. Now, the ICBMs are those horrible missiles that are scattered around, I think, five Western states that are permanently set on trigger alert to respond to an attack from Russia. And once they're sent, they can't be brought back. Now, the military is actually asked for, asked to end this. Uh, and it's a huge expense. But um, what has gotten into this year's budget is to, um, to replace them with a whole bunch of new, you, you know, new uh, missiles. So there is, and the reason we were talking about this is one of the very few opportunities that people have to protest our expenditures on nuclear weapons is it uh, Vancouver, Vancouver, it's a, it's a base in California where the missiles are tested and periodically a missile without a, a, a nuclear weapon on it uh, is sent off to like the Marshall Islands, which is of course ironic because those are the uh, islands that we destroyed with uh, testing nuclear weapons, you know, back in the day when when there was testing. But one of that, that will be taking place 
one of these tests will be taking place and there's an effort to get people uh, to um, to respond. And of course it means going to California to do that, but to get um, the, uh, the publicity about this, because as I say, it's the really only opportunity to see uh, preparations for nuclear weapons in action. And I guess my question is, is, is the whole issue of ICBMs, uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles, is that broken down in, in your website? Uh, that is a good question. I think we don't have specifically um, ICBMs. However, in the trade-offs tool, we do include nuclear weapons spending more broadly, um, which I'll just show. So if you go to the drop-down menu of the trade-offs tool that I just showed, um, if we choose nuclear weapons um, in, the, in the most recent available year, that was $22 billion. And then we have trade-offs that you can see for, for how much have been funded instead on other things. So we don't have specific numbers for ICBMs, mm -hmm. but um, if you do have a number on hand from some other source, you can also customize the tool oh. to add some other amount. So let's just say it was $5 billion. You can uh -huh. let's make number of zeros. That's zero. 50 billion, that's too many. But let's say it was five billion, you could see trade-offs for that. Wow. Oh, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean it's the ICBMs to remind people is one of the three um uh, tripods of militarism. It's either the submarines or the bombers or these ICBMs that are tucked away in these um Western states in in a big concrete um, sort of a um, uh, bunkers closet area. So um, anyway, any other any other questions? Um, and ye yes, Jean. I remember you're talking about a lot of Western states having ICBMs. Is there a chart or statistics on which state receives the most money, military money or? Mm. Well, uh, what we were hearing uh, in our disarm talk a few days ago was that, uh, yes, I mean, it's very hard to get those states or those senators <laughs> to vote against funding because this mm -hmm. is a real jobs project for those states and they're very <laughs> committed to them. and. Uh, it will be hard to dislodge. And that's that, how we ended up with the F-35s, right? <laughs> yes, <laughs> our jobs. Uh, oh. Good, all right. Well, well. thank you so much, uh, Ashik, and um, please stay on. And um, I want to invite um, Beth Ann to, to join us and to just say that, um, uh, she is um, uh, she is a active in community organizing with the Vermont Interfaith Action. Uh, she's a retired doctor and is a deacon in the Good Shepherd Episcopal Church in Barrie. So um, I met people from that church three years ago when I uh, uh, protested in the state house as part of the Poor People's Campaign and the. The minister then, actually, he's a rector, um, Earl Cooper Camp, was active in uh, helping to get us um, not sent to jail and to take care of us. And he was very active a few days ago at the uh, uh, Poor People's Campaign in, in in Montpelier. He was leading the charts, so uh, the chants. So I think of that church as being really the most progressive church um, in our state. And so I I want to welcome Beth Ann to tell us some of the things that happened at that event and what is planned to be down the line in terms of the cuts and how they're going to affect us. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. I was just reading the last uh, thing in the chat from 
a sheik here, which is interesting, on uh, spending for the Ukrainian conflict. Oh, yes. Good. Um, so I'm going to give a, an overview of what we're seeing in Vermont and what the path has been that's brought us to this point. Um, right now we have over 3,000 people who are without permanent housing. Um, those are the people we know about. Uh, there are many other people that we don't know about that are still doubled up uh, living on grandma's couch or uh, in some instances sleeping in cars, uh, but just haven't entered the system in any way that we know about. Uh, about 80% of the people who are homeless in Vermont are currently sheltered in hotels. And the funding for that came early on in COVID through uh, federal money. It was FEMA money, emergency management money. And uh, Duncan, are you trying to talk? No, can you say the percentage of people in hotels that are Almost is that the, the figure I've seen is is eighty percent of our current uh, population of people who are who are without housing. Okay, unhoused. Um, okay, thank you. And that that funding ended at the end of March. So the Budget Adjustment Act. This is all now in Vermont. The Budget Adjustment Act to the Vermont. Uh, 2023 budget, which we're currently in, we're currently spending the 2023 budget until July. Uh, so they found enough money to keep people in the, the hotels through May. Uh, at the end of May, anybody who does not meet their eligibility requirements will need to exit the hotels. Uh, and that is roughly a thousand people. So a thousand people will be exiting the hotels at the end of May without any plan for where they will go. The, the shelters, the congregate shelter spaces that we have are at capacity. They've been full continuously. Um, and there just is no plan for what to you know, how to continue to shelter a thousand people. Uh, to give you an idea of what a thousand people will look like uh, when they end up out in our communities, that's five times the number of unsheltered people that we had pre-COVID. So wherever you live, if you can think of images in your mind of what it's looked like for unsheltered people in your communities prior to COVID, then think about five times that number. So basically what the state is proposing is to just turn this over to the communities to deal with. And um, so I should say that the fiscal year 24 budget is now in process of being formed. It has uh, been voted out from the House, and it's currently under consideration in the Senate. Uh, the governor's request was to put $26 million in the fiscal year 24 budget that would allow people who were el met eligibility, and I'll talk about what that is, eligibility requirements to stay hotel housed. So, and it's not entirely certain how many people we're talking about, but but roughly we're talking about 60% of the people who are currently hotel housed will stay hotel housed um, because they meet eligibility requirements. And that those the eligibility is if you are a household with a child, they will continue to be sheltered. If you are over 60, if you have a disability and they have a very narrow definition of disability that you have to have been classified disabled 
by state disability or or receiving SSI uh, federal disability insurance. Uh, but there is a wide group of people who are truly disabled, who have not been able to work through the disability system, and they will be on the streets. Um, if you've been fleeing domestic violence and you went through the right paths of, of clarifying that, then you, uh, you will continue to be sheltered in the hotels. Uh, if you had to recently leave a dwelling because it was subs, it didn't meet um, the standards set by the state. Um, so that means that you had to ask for an inspection. Um, but but they get a certain period, number of days that they get to stay in the hotels. So the governor asked for twenty six million to house those folks in the hotels. The house in their budget proposal went along with the, the governor's request. To put that in perspective, we've been spending about $72 million in the last year to have all these folks in hotels. So we are going to be, we are going to budget a third of what we've been spending, uh, even though we know that 60% will meet eligibility. It, it just really, the math doesn't work. And, um, and the House didn't push it. And so we're really working with the Senate to see if, if they can add some money and a better plan. That's, that's the other aspect of this, is that the administration now has had three years to be smarter about how they use this money. Uh, but they've been paying hotel owners, tourist room rates. Yes, that's uh, an important factor, so, expensive. So for a, a single room, for a single person in the hotel that I'm most familiar with, I, I live in the central Vermont area, um, I personally wouldn't stay there. I wouldn't have stayed there before COVID. And, and they haven't spent any of all the money they've been making. They haven't spent that money to update or renovate or take care of this facility. What they did was they bought a much swankier hotel down the street, those hotel owners. But um, that one room cost $3,400 a month. What? Yeah, $3,400 a month is what the state has been paying for one room for one person. If they if it's one room for two people, it's closer to six thousand dollars. So that's like a hundred dollars, a little more than a hundred dollars a night. A night. Yeah, I think they have a cap that they won't. The, st the state has a cap that it won't spend over one hundred and seventy five dollars a night for a room. Mm. Well, that's nice. <laughs> and they've been doing this for three years without trying to figure out a smarter way to take care of folks. Yeah. In those rooms, they have a little, I mean, you've all been in hotel rooms, I would imagine, a little microwave and a little mini fridge. They're not allowed to have electrical appliances. They can't have a hot plate. Um, they, you know, if they bring in an electric tea kettle, they're in danger of getting evicted. Um, so, it's it's been a nightmare. I mean, nobody is saying that we should continue hotel housing, but there's no other plans that have been. There are a couple of plans that are now starting to surface. Uh, Teresa Wood, who's the head of House Human Services Committee, says that there are I forget the exact figures, 250 empty mobile home lots, and that you that. For $40 million, they could put a mobile home on each of these empty lots um, that would provide 250 units of housing. So that's that's hopeful for $40 million. Um, it's, um, I know that uh, the Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition is presenting a plan now to the Senate that for $40 million, uh, nonprofits or communities could submit a grant to purchase 
uh, hotel properties or other properties and uh, and and run some kind of shelter within them. Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, in Burlington, we've done that. The Champlain Housing uh, Trust. Organization has bought- Trust, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's been done in other parts of the state as well. Typically, those have been full-scale development projects uh, and and they don't happen quickly. You know, the renovation doesn't happen quickly. Uh, this would be a plan where, and, and this is based on a, a program in Oregon called the Oregon Turnkey Program, where they, uh, they put this plan up and nonprofits would uh, acquire the property and do minimal renovations, get people right into them, and then uh, kind of renovate them as they go along. And then when they no longer need them as shelters, then they would be developable as affordable housing uh, properties. And I just want to point out my very big concern about the trailers is that most of our mobile home parks or are in floodplains. Right. And, um, in, in professionally, I've seen that very, very devastating. You know, even a small stream can wipe out a trailer park. You know, if you look at most of the low income housing in the state, it's in floodplains. Yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, or mountain hollows with little access. But um, so, yes, I, it's not at all ideal, um, but much preferable to somebody trying to live on the street or in a tent in the woods. Um, that. Yes, and I, I, I think that the there are a fairly significant number of um, vacant industrial or business buildings as well that could also be used that are much safer. Where we we're not putting people in harm's way. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's going to be. It's going to be a huge problem. And meanwhile, the governor is asking that 100 million, because we've had a pretty good revenue year, the governor is asking that $100 million be put in a, as a place marker to match future federal grant monies that might come on projects, on infrastructure projects. Um, and so this would be like a reserve of $100 million in order to do future infrastructure projects. Uh, when you're talking about putting 1,000 people literally out on the street. So that's, that's what we're concerned about. Um, meanwhile, the other um, aspect of this from a poverty point of view is that uh, that federal money that federal uh, emergency management money was also giving a lot of rental assistance to people that are living permanently housed, uh, but have low incomes. And as rents, there's been no kind of control of rents. Rents, as you know, have just been skyrocketing. So people have been unable to continue to meet their, their rents and they've lost that rental subsidy at the same time that they've lost a lot of food support. Um, so we're really feeling like we're gonna see a huge um, crisis in terms of, of the challenges for people who have very little. I see, I see these hands, um, Jane, I believe your hand's been up for a while. She spoke before, oh. I think, but uh, how about Duncan? Duncan. And you can take oh, down. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, I'll take, I'll, take, I'll take down my hand. I, I, I've forgotten about that. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I had another. Yeah, go ahead, Duncan. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I'm in White River Junction, Vermont area, and our shelter here is the Haven, and the Haven... I don't know, just a sign outside of the Haven, or maybe it was on the store in Norwich, said that there are 500 
people who are unhoused in the Upper Valley, which is my area. Seems like a lot. And you're, and I think now that would include part of New Hampshire, of course, because we're, we're right next to New Hampshire, but the Upper Valley, these four or five towns. So that's a lot of people. Um, but there's a f person here that has a an organization called Digs, and they, I forget what it's called, but they build tiny houses. They call them emergency shelters. And um, uh, they're quite radical. They'll bring these little houses that they make, and they'll they'll slide them down the railroad tracks. And they'll get them to an area in the woods or in an area where people are staying, and they'll get them a place to live. So, or at least to lock, be able to lock, you know, be safe. So, um, so I'm I'm wondering a little bit. But my question is, okay, so there's 80 percent of people in Vermont are in hotels who are unhoused, and so what about the other 20 percent? I mean. I know they may be on couches and things like that, but I'm wondering how that breaks down. Are they in the woods? Are they in tents? Uh, most of them are in other shelters. So like the people that are at the Haven yeah. are not in that 80%. The people that are at Good Samaritan Haven and Barry are not uh -huh. in the, oh, the thank people you. that are at Cots in Chittenden County. So, and then there's uh, the network, the, uh, uh, there's there are there are several uh, shelters for people fleeing domestic violence. Uh, there are uh, a number of uh, scattered site family shelters being run by community action agencies. So, so there are a lot of people who are considered homeless who are who meet the qualification of the title homeless, but they are housed in various shelters. Some of them are congregate with four people to a room. We, you know, that went way down during COVID, but it started to inch back up. And could you speak about the role of churches? I mean, you, um, uh, when I was online looking at the Church of the Good Shepherd, you you have um, some a dozen um, pots there. Are those filled every night? And uh, do you foresee um, more and more people coming? to stay there? So actually the um, the the nighttime shelter is at Christ Episcopal Church in Montpelier. I'm affiliated with both the Church of the Good Shepherd in Barrie and Christ Episcopal Church in Montpelier. And uh, all winter, during the cold winter, with the, um, what do they call it? Anyway. The state has a has a, a period of time that they consider uh, cold weather, and they had some money available for an over what they call an overflow shelter. Um, so we have been providing nighttime shelter in the parish hall of Christ Episcopal Church for ten to twelve people, depending on the night. Um, they sleep on cots. They're in a room that's about uh, 25 feet by 35 feet. Um, and, and there's 12 cots in there. And they have to leave in the morning. Uh, there are other warm spaces they go to. They go to the library. Um, there is a drop-in center in town. Um, and then at night, uh, we've had to open up evening warming shelters and those have been happening in the churches um and then at eight o'clock at night they come back over to christ church and they go to bed for the night so it's kind of a itinerant shelter experience it's you know they have to carry everything with them uh, we don't have any showers uh, so there is the drop-in center they can take a shower there but um that those are there have always been uh, that kind of number of unsheltered people through the winter. And those people will, that shelter will close on April 15th because that's when the state funding um, uh, is no longer available for that. Really? The shelter in, in your church? Yeah. Well, that's four days from now. It is. And what does it cost 
say per night per 12 people what are the costs the church is bearing so the uh, the church is not real is not i have to say honestly the church is not bearing a cost other than utilities um the the cost is for staffing mm -hmm. because you can't just have 12 people who are living homeless be in a room together without a staff yeah <laughs> uh, right. it just isn't going to work uh, so uh the staffing is being done by uh, a nonprofit organization and so that's the cost. So the cost is, um, is what it costs for staff. Mm. Wow. Thank you. I mean, when you think about it, um, every, every unhoused person once had a house. And um, is that one of the efforts to help them get back to where they were or are, have most people sort of cut their ties there's no opportunity to um, go well, back to where they were. Um, there's been a big effort to have everybody that we know is without housing be enrolled in what's called coordinated entry. Uh, this happens in each district of the state. And coordinated entry is a list that's kept. And as housing becomes, as units open up, uh, there are vouchers that are available and try to, but people are put on the list with priority points, uh, depending on what your situation is. So yes, there's a lot of effort to get everybody into housing, but there is no housing. You know, we have, I'm sure you all read this, that, you know, we have the uh, lowest rental vacancy rate in the country. We are second highest in our rate of homelessness, but we're also, we've been right up there uh, also in the percent of our people who are sheltered, who are homeless. So we've done a good job of sheltering them so far, although we're talking about hotel shelters. Um, I think that the, the thing that really disturbs me is that this body of people did not, they didn't make a decision to get themselves in the, this kind of difficulty. Mm -hmm. uh, they basically were not able to make income that allowed them to keep housing, stable housing. And, and that's because we have not provided a minimum wage that meets the very basic needs of people to remain housed and fed and warm, much less any other frills like transportation or childcare. Uh, you cannot, you cannot keep yourself housed and fed on a minimum wage. Uh, if you can get a full time job. That's right, at a full time job. There are, you know, there's a lot of jobs right now, but. Uh, and the wages are going up. We also have made decisions for about 30 years not to build an adequate amount of housing. Mm -hmm. um, we have it written into statute that uh, money that comes from half of the money that comes from property tax, you know, the transfer tax. When you buy a property, you pay a transfer tax. 50% of that money is supposed to go to the Vermont Housing Conservation Board. Um, and most of that money is used to build affordable housing. But we have underfunded that. They have, they have decided not to give the required 50% for most of the last 20 to 30 years. Wow. wow. Uh, and that's how we got here. Is that yeah. worth a lawsuit? Um, there is a clause in that statute that says that gives them an out if it's needed for something else or, you know, something equally fuzzy. So um, I see um, that uh, Pamela has her hand up. You want to speak, Pamela? Yes. Well, actually, that's part of the question that I was interested in knowing about because I know that during COVID, 
it was announced that the state had delayed um, the initiation of building for affordable housing, despite actually having surplus funds at that time. And the other interesting point about the coordinated entry issue in relation to the other programs like Section 8 or um, Vermont the State other, Housing yeah, Authority. Yeah, Vermont State House. Well, but they, they actually cross together. And what, what's interesting is um, I actually was asked for a while when CBOEO was looking, I mean, the scope of this was a little broader than exactly housing. Um, but I actually did some work with the online educational uh, program that they run to give tenant information about the paths to housing. And what was really interesting about it is, is that there are so many issues, for instance, this issue of affordability once you have a job. Well, this is an interesting one because the income caps and um, whatever other assets that you have are actually quite low to actually be maintained <laughs> even if you get one of these vouchers. The other thing is these vouchers are timed, some of the ones that come up with coordinated entry. And they usually give you 60 days. If you cannot find housing that meets the criteria, you know, and can pass inspection, you lose the voucher and you start all over if you choose to, to get on the list. And this is a big problem, um, at least for, I mean, and the same is true for certain Section 8 vouchers. The other thing is that some of the new affordable housing that has been built, I know, for instance, in Winooski, they built, they have built what is termed <laughs> affordable housing, but it is still far beyond, several hundred dollars beyond what is reimbursable by section eight. So that means that you can use a voucher, but you have to pay the difference. Mm, wow. And then what's interesting, but see, this is the, the catch 22. Then you could end up needing to make more money than the section eight voucher actually allows you to make. Yeah. <laughs> in order to pay the difference between what Section 8 reimburses and what the rental charge is for you to remain. So, and, and when we get into the poverty aspect um, of creating the means for somebody to gain self-sufficiency, this is a significant factor in that. Wow, well, thank it's you. Uh, it's yeah. very complex and um, and with lots of ins and outs. We've ha Vermont has had to turn a significant number of vouchers back to the government. We've lost those the use of those vouchers because there wasn't anything to rent for the amount that the voucher was for. Wow. Um, and the state can't like say, okay, we're going to give you a little boost. We're going to give you a a little bit of extra money, state money, so that you can use your federal voucher and your state money and rent. But that doesn't work either because that then gets counted as your income and that makes you ineligible for the voucher. It's very mixed up and awful. Yeah, yeah except that the uh, VHAP, that what you're talking about that is no longer going away, that actually closed some of those gaps because people could request 
and I mean, and you could get it up to 18 months if you went through coordinated entry, went to a program. That cap was different. You probably could, I mean, there was a wider range of quote unquote affordable housing that you could get. The problem is again, at the 18 month point, then the idea is hopefully you have received the voucher, but then that funding is no longer available. Now, there is still a portal that says the state could look for other means to actually fund that program. Mm -hmm. But it is another thing that is a good thing, but, um, you know, it, it it is time limited. And like I say, I, I think part of the problem is um, it, for a while, um, disincentivizes working. Well, I shouldn't say, say it this way. You need to be working because the other thing is also the transportation piece for people to get other jobs. Yeah. And then there's kind of a timing. You have to know your evaluation point and you have to make sure your income goes back down. Hey, well, um, we, have, we have some other questions here. Yeah. So I, I was just wondering if there is any reality to the state actually reinvesting in what used to be that temporary VHAP 18 month uh, supplemental rental assistance? Just quick, a quick answer is I do think that they do have some money in the budget that is earmarked for continuing some degree of rental subsidy support, but how that would be, how that would work and who it's targeted for, I can't answer. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, Ricky, would you like to, uh... I, I wanted to ask a couple of clarifying questions, but in the meantime, because of what Pamela has been sharing and what Beth Ann has been talking about, I, I'm thinking of a book that I'm reading that I really want to recommend. It's called, uh, can you read, see that? Oh, it's backwards, isn't it? No, no, <laughs> it's good. It's good. Poverty, comma, by America, in which um, the writer, Matthew Desmond, who is rather brilliant, um, is... Uh, is saying that we need to begin to ask not questions about the poor. Well, how did they how did they get here? Uh, where are they trying to get back to? Uh, what what is causing this poverty? But instead, be asking the question: Who, who benefits? Because um, we're looking at a whole lot of bucks that benefited somebody um, to to house people in. Um, in, in motels instead of uh, making a plan to do something more um, community oriented that would actually help people get back into. And the same thing is true for the federal and state rules that you can see it. it's a lot of work to be poor. You really have to study up to be poor and find your way through the maze. And, and um, the maze is really, um, I mean, I'm talking because I, I, I worked at Community Action for years and years and years, and so I've been thinking about these problems a long time, but uh, there is a correlation between policies that benefit a few and the problems that we're looking at in our community. Um, but anyway, that's, that's my comment. But I wanted to ask a question about this uh, coordinated re-entry Beth Ann, you said something about uh, with certain kinds of points, and I missed the word in front of points. What kind of points are they? They're priority. They move you up higher to the top of the line, and and they're the same kind of things. They are if you have a child in the family, if you are disabled, if you're elderly. Um, there are some things that move bump you up in the in the queue. I see. I see. Good. And then um, you mentioned the Housing Conservation Trust Fund and the statute that um, wanted 50% to go to the housing conservation. Con and we haven't done that for 15 or 20 years. What what was the um, statute saying exactly? I missed out on that too. So the 
this is the property transfer tax, and it was it was designated that half of this tax, half of the revenue from this tax would go to uh, the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. And they are tasked with moving this money out for either housing or conservation efforts. And they've been a wonderful organization. They've actually been, a, I mean, I'd rather they're one of the, that they've been very effective in, 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 in helping to in helping to, 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 to build a, a afford, affordable housing and at the yeah. same time come conserving 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 lands as well i mean so do, uh, maybe conserving lands against 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 too much development right a, yeah. yeah i agree they're a wonderful organization i i wasn't um i just wanted to make sure i had the right names for things but I have to say that a lot of money was designated our, um, through the ARPA funding and various, you know, a lot of the revenue that came to the state from the federal government through COVID has been channeled to build affordable housing. And there is a lot of money designated in this budget that's being proposed to build affordable housing. And we are all for that. You know, it's, it's a lot of money. It's a lot more than we spent, and it will hopefully make up for all those years we didn't spend enough. But we're two or three years away from moving people into those new units. And what we need is a bridge from where people are now to when they can be housed. I'll just add one little other thing that's a bit of good news, and that is um, our new treasurer, Mike Hitchek has just been talking about reinvigorating um, the 10% plan of investing some of Vermont's cash flow into local investments, which people who are interested in Vermont public banking are probably uh, excited about. I know I am. But, um, but again, it, it's going to take a while until that money actually builds houses that, that will be. Um, and, and we have to determine what sort of housing are we going to build. Where are we going to build it? I imagine it'll be a, a tussle making those decisions. Well, uh, my question is, where is the outrage? I mean, uh, that's why being at the Poor People's Campaign was, was really moving for me because there were a few people, especially Earl, Earl Cooper, Cooper Camp is able to sort of articulate um, the the uh, painfulness that is going to be happening. And so I'm wondering, um, uh, Beth Ann, about the churches and other churches, are they stepping forward? You're in Vermont uh, Interfaith Action. What are they doing? And who who are they mainly? Is that- so Vermont Interfaith Action is, uh, ha is an affiliation of I think it's over 80 congregate, 80 communities of faith in Vermont, um, and it is interfaith. And um, we have uh, have had uh, an organizing committee on affordable housing and homelessness now for eight years, and so we are fairly well known at the legislature because we badger people there. We're known by the governor because we badger him. We're known by people at the Agency of Human Services because we badger them. Um, and we write op-eds. We recently had an op-ed in Vermont Digger and in various newspapers. Um, we hold press conferences. We hold actions. Um, so that's what we do. Uh, and uh, there are other organizing committees within Vermont Interfaith Action that are looking at uh, prison conditions, especially for women, you mentioned. Uh, uh, they're looking at uh, racial justice. Um, they've been working with new American families on uh, navigating the educational system. So there's, there's other organizing groups within Vermont Interfaith Action, but the one I've been focused on has been uh, affordable housing and homelessness. Well, several several members here, uh, several people here are members of the Friends Meeting, uh, and Jean, you're very active on housing. What what group uh, do you work through mainly? 
Uh, well, I'm with the League of Women Voters, and if you vote, in order to vote, you have to have an address. So I'm always saying, you know, we've got to make sure everybody has a place to live with an address so they can vote. Um, but actually working with uh, Wilf, <laughs> combining it's wonderful, Marguerite is bringing Wilf and the League together, and I think we'll <laughs> mm -hmm. work something there. And we're starting to talk at um, Burlington Friends Meeting, too, about housing. Of course, they do have rental places there. So, yeah. What I don't understand is why this is not an emergency. Yeah. Um, we have, I, be, I mean, I'm assuming the Vermont budget for 2223, which is still, I believe, in effect. Help me out on this, Beth. But um, that probably has some emergency line items in there. Why? And we're putting together a budget for 2324. Um, and these need to be recognized as not homelessness, as emergencies. This is these are real people, mm -hmm. right? Uh, living beings dying. Yeah. Well, housing is health care. How can you keep people healthy if they don't have housing? Yes. And I just think that I would I certainly wish we had a governor who would say, okay, we're going to totally focus mm -hmm. on this. Here's a real action plan, whether it be some of those units such as they have in Burlington, those pods or whatever they call them, or tiny houses. And then we're going to look at our vacant, existing vacant buildings and we're going to just see where we can pour some money in real quick to get these things done. And, you know, so it should be an emergency. And I really think that um, a much larger portion of our budget um, should be taken away from more discretionary funding and put immediately into constructing long-term low-income housing or long-term housing, period. Why are we always labeling it low-income? Yeah. But it is housing for people. I mean, the, just our whole language, languaging around this is 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 very, very discriminatory, I think. Mm -hmm. The governor likes to use the term workforce housing uh, because he is focused on growing. Slaves coming into work. <laughs> you know, growing Vermont's workforce and housing has definitely been a barrier to growing Vermont's right. workforce. Mm -hmm. uh, but he is not at all interested in growing government uh, or taking on a project of the scale as as government. Uh, that just is not in his Republican mojo. So uh, it's very interesting. Do we need to put pressure on the legislature and then let the Yeah, actually the Senate has with S-100 yeah. that has been passed by the Senate and it's now in the House. So I think we could encourage that to go through. So and we'll look S-100 is about building affordable housing, mm -hmm. and it's about changing um, zoning regulations and yeah. environmental restrictions so that right. it can happen. It is not about addressing the emergency. That's true. Yeah. Um, no. We And whatever we, dollars we invest in an emergency program, from my perspective, ought to be well mm -hmm. enough thought out by so that it's going to last a long time in other words yeah. yeah we just don't and it has multiple reuse if it's not needed any longer for housing right so i think with something we really need to be very very wise but we need to do it now and we need to do it quickly i, I can't believe i live in a state that um is going to literally allow turn its back and allow so many people to suffer. Right. I, I, I see that... Duncan, Duncan is here with a, with his hand raised. You want to go it's not on? my hand. That's the yellow uh, icon. Yeah. Just kidding. <laughs> um, let me try that. Um, 
so I don't want to change the subject, but this might change it a little bit, and, but it doesn't have to. So you're talking about legislation and you're talking about funds, uh, government funding. Well, as a social worker now in private practice, so I don't work with a lot of poor people, but I have, a lot of people are not getting services anywhere. They're living with families, their own families, or crashing somewhere or living in a trailer somewhere no one even knows are there. So I imagine a lot of the the numbers that we're talking about doesn't include them or they're in and out trying to be eligible sometimes. But I guess my question is very specifically, so I'm with uh, this new group that Robin and I started with a couple other people called the Vermont Peace and Anti-War Coalition. And we started a couple months ago and we we t we we uh, have an association with the Vermont Libertarian Party, who doesn't believe in government, and so you know at least on some level. And I imagine they they would also like to help people in need. And I'm wondering if you see, you know, any non-governmental, non-progressive Democrat, Republican, you know, any groups in Vermont. As you said, there are 80 interfaith. Um, churches or groups in Vermont that you work with, or there are that. I don't know what, what that statistic was, but I think it's very interesting to look at the whole picture. You know, maybe in 10 years, there won't be any government or services. And in other words, we'll be in a complete collapse. So we're going to have to take care of each other. Now, I know that sounds like I'm changing the subject, but I'm really not. I'm just, I'm just trying to fill it out, fill out the picture. What do you see, Beth, in terms of... Um, you know, the non, I mean, we're talking about how to solve problems with right. money. What do you see just about the big picture? Well, the big picture is that the this large number of people need a lot of support. Uh, they need a lot of support navigating all of life's challenges. Um, and, you know, if we have room in our houses to open our houses up and invite some people in, we should do that. But on the other hand, uh, people come with their, their problems and that might not be uh, that acceptable to have a number of people with all of their life's problems living in our spaces. Uh, you know, it's, it's hard. Um, I've, you know, I've spent living time with some people who are living uh, without housing and it's, it takes its toll. Uh, yeah. Yeah. As a social worker, you know that. Uh, yeah. Definitely there are nonprofits to do this work. Uh, we need to have funding to support the support people. Yeah. Uh, it's a deep problem. It's a deep, deep problem, right? Well, because we used to say, it's just at Clara Martin Center, which is the Orange County Mental Health, we used to say, well, we if we're we're, we're not the last people to help, we'll, we'll give as many services as we can, but the family has to help. So people who have problems go to the family, but sometimes the family has problems. And so it's really a deep problem here. So uh, I, I totally agree with, uh, <laughs> was it Catherine, that, you know, it's an emergency, but it's going to be more of an emergency anyway. One of the ways that this has been addressed uh, through governmental programs is uh, a lot of people are living in more living space than they need. Uh, you know, we have an older population. They don't need all the big living space that they needed when they were raising their families. And so there is money available for people to make accessory dwelling units. A smaller part of their house can be made into a living unit for somebody who doesn't have any place to live. And it doesn't have to communicate with your own living space, you know, but it's part of your house and you rent it. Um, you can get some income, although it it's um, if you take the government help to renovate that space into a single unit, um, you have to agree that it will be affordable for a certain number of years. 
you know, I, I think talking up this program to everybody, you know, and, and getting people to, to consider this as a possibility of increasing living spaces would be wonderful. Isn't it uh, called home share or is that just part well, of it? Home share is different. Home share is wonderful. This is called, uh, it's Vermont Home Improvement VHIP, VHIP, <laughs> VHIP. And you can get $50,000 to make this accessory dwelling unit in part of your living space. Now, quite honestly, it's gonna cost more than $50,000. If you really want a full living space with plumbing connections and an outside entrance and everything, but it's, but then you, you actually make some income from this space. Mm -hmm. So that's a way to move it out into the communities and away from the government and the government helps you get it started. Mm. I see there's <laughs> more questions here. Um, and uh, Jane and then Jean. Jane, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah, thanks. Um, I guess it's troubling that people were put in shelters without without supportive services to help to help them get jobs and to get training. Is that correct that the, that these shelter that that these shelters um, have don't have um, I mean they're just being held that they're, they're the onions are in the hotel in the moat in the hotels. They're they're just being housed, but there's not are there but there's not caseworkers. That is help. true. That in many of the hotels there has been no support. In some of the hotels, there has been a package of support that's been quite effective. And I don't know why some of the hotels were able to do it and other hotels didn't. But uh, but most of the hotels that I'm familiar with in central Vermont, they have not had support in the hotels. Uh, they they often have housing case managers through the community action agency uh, that tend to be very hard to get a hold of and aren't very responsive. But uh, but no, they haven't gotten support for a lot of their other life challenges, vocation substance use, disability, uh, it, it isn't happening. Wow. Okay, so Jean, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I keep thinking about the Champlain Housing Trust, which finally um, was determined to be the assistant with the pods down in Burlington. And I guess they're helping the people there with the, at, at those pods. Um, but, I, you know, just finally thought, you know, let's move our military budget over to Champlain Housing Trust or something. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Can we do that? <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing you can do this week is uh, email or call your senators, your state senators, and tell them that this is an emergency, that you're a constituent, you think this is an emergency and it has to be attended to, that it has to go way up on the priority list of whatever else they're thinking about. Because they, you know, I am all for increasing the support of childcare, but, you know, if you're talking about people not having shelter, um, that puts it way up. So what would we say to them in terms of a, of a, a bill that they should support would that be S100? Well, S100 doesn't doesn't speak to emergency housing. Uh -huh. It speaks to building more affordable housing. So um, what you tell them to do then. Tell them that they need to find a path to put money in the budget to uh, to give people emergency shelter. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. All our all our homeless. In other words, not just a few. Right. Uh, to, to ensure that, that everybody has shelter. Yeah, yes. And so in terms of, as, as we're sort of wrapping up here, in terms of groups working on this Vermont Interfaith Action, which um, Quaker Meeting has been part of, do you know whether Quaker meeting ever attends those sessions. I think our we, meeting is not. We have not had anybody in our affordable housing and homelessness 
organizing committee who's been affiliated with Quaker Meeting. Uh, I know from time to time there have been people active in, in VIA uh, who identify as uh, being part of a Quake, uh, Quaker meeting. I mean, I think we just all have to get more radical and uh, and and be supporting. And if you could keep us aware of uh, pressure points, um, I, I mean, this is important, like nuclear weapons, that's abolition is important. I mean, <laughs> we have to work both angles here. Mm. Are there any other uh, other comment, Mary Ellen? What have you been thinking? Oops, I'm I'm um, I'm I'm playing devil uh, dev uh, yeah, devil's advocate. Uh -huh. uh, mainly because my daughter and my son-in-law are in the hotel business, oh. in the higher income hotel business. So I'm just curious that these hotels that actually provide shelter, how much damage is done to the places why the homeless are living there? Oh. I can answer that to some extent, a lot. And that is because these hotels are not made durably in the first place. Okay. Yeah, no, there's a lot of damage. And um, yeah. There is, which, 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 why, which is going to discourage hotels from stepping forward to to provide rooms, right? And it also means while the residents, the homeless people, have been residing in the hotel and motel rooms, there's been very little maintenance or care of those rooms. Yeah. Um, so, and I think you know, if our kids act that way, I'm sure you know we might feel you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, but I get the whole point, picture. So I'm listening to the whole picture. I just wanted to play devil's advocate for a minute. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And yeah. the fo those folks need help yeah. and need friendship and support and food. And yeah. You know, for $3,500 a month, you, oh. can re you can repair a lot of doors. Yeah. Um, you know, mm -hmm. but the hotel I'm most familiar with, they've had an old boiler system that they have not replaced or or repaired for three years now. And every now and then there's no hot water in the hotel for for day for several days. Um, that just for thirty five hundred dollars a month, that's not acceptable. Yeah. Right. That, that's the management. That's the management looking after themselves and just wanting the income that they can get per day. Mm -hmm. And and it's the great. state has no the state has no contract with them. Okay. Oh, really? They have no contract with them, so they can they have no basis for making them accountable other than uh, state standards of state living standards. Uh, no, they they made it. They made the decision to have tenancy contracts between the resident and the hotel owner and the state just pays and it doesn't have any contract with the hotel. Maybe that needs to be changed. Huh. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah. This has been incredibly informative and disturbing. Um, I mean, I think if, if Mary Beth, if you can put me on your mailing list or Tell me, and I can spread whatever insights you gain or steps that we should take, or let's all go and bring our pitchforks to the state house someday or other. Let us know. I mean, uh, I think- well, start we by making a phone call. Yeah. You okay. know, your legislators want you to vote for them again. They will listen to you. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, call your whoever is- your area um, and just tell them that this is a crisis that they're not addressing. Yes, okay, and Jean, one final word here. Yours. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention Green Mountain Hotel for Humanity. Um, if they could, I would think anybody would be happier where they live if they know they own it and they're secure and they can't be kicked out of it. 
Mm-hmm. So um, just to encourage home ownership. Yeah. Well, as a longtime land use planner, that mm-hmm. increases by um, a pretty much 90%. If you own your house, then you're a person who owns a house is 90% more likely to take care of things and keep it neat and clean right. than a renter. Yeah. Wow. I see a picture of uh, Charlotte Dennett there. Good heavens. No, oh, I yeah. mean, I've been here the whole time, but I have this problem. It's bobblehead or whatever. So that's why I have to turn off my uh, video. Uh, okay. I, so, I haven't coming? figured out what's wrong. Okay. okay. Sure. I, I, yeah. It, I was just going to say, let's remember what just happened in Tennessee. I mean, you're right. You got you got to agitate. The people have to start with the phone calls for sure. Should put out a whole message based on some of this information that's been conveyed today, and then people have to go. They have to go sit in mm-hmm. on a hearing. They have to demand a hearing. Mm-hmm. And I mean, we could be part of it, but uh, that's the only way they're gonna they're gonna respond. I think I think Tennessee was a perfect example. Mm-hmm. Wow. Well, I, I've committed myself to going to the city council next Monday, but it's to, uh, I'm going with a whistle and uh, I'm going to blow my whistle. And this is homage to all the whistleblowers and the fact that uh, next <laughs> week or something is uh, Daniel Ellsberg week because he's very ill and people want to pay attention yeah. to him. And of course he um, his uh, revelations of the Pentagon papers led to the um, defeat of the the end of the Vietnam War, and that can be connected to these issues. It's all about spending. So I will try to figure out how to, in my two words before the city council, <laughs> make some connection here. So um, very good. I think you've set the fire under us, um, Beth Ann. So thank you so much, and thank you for everyone who turned up and. Um, Let's keep going.